Thank you so much. A real privilege to be here. We're very excited to be here to tell our own story today. Uh, it's really a two-year story that we've been uh, walking on the Agile journey. And it's in the investment bank. You know, it's quite uh, confusing. We have uh, corporate bank, investment bank. This is the investment bank. So the story I'm going to tell you today is very much like a romance novel. It's not the Ashley Madison type of romance, but certainly a type of romance. Um, and it's really aimed at people wanting to adopt Agile in their enterprises. So it's a story for you. We talk about our practical experience. Uh, we talk about what worked and what didn't. And I think what didn't work is as useful as what worked. What we also do is we talk about how things work a couple years back. What was the environment? What was the need? Um, and the shifts in the people, the shifts in the teams, and ultimately the organization. But of course the value. Why do this unless there's real value? How can you articulate it? How do you sell it? Uh, we also give you a bit of feedback and, and some of the challenges we'll highlight. So, go back to 2012. So, in 2012, that was an interesting time for us. We, uh, we had a couple of business restructures. We centralized the IT uh, division, much to our business's dismay. And uh, at that time, there was a lot of fear from our business in terms of the guys saying, well, you centralized, you've taken our teams away from us, our deployed teams. Can you still deliver? Can we trust you to deliver? The other thing is uh, are the mindsets that the people were in at that time is that they, they didn't feel empowered to make positive changes. So people were quite stuck. At that time, I was uh, very fortunate to be given a position of development and integration. And post restructure, unfortunately, we lost a lot of people. So I spent a lot of my time recruiting. I still see myself as a professional recruiter. Um, a lot of people can probably comment on that in the audience, I see some smiles. Um, so around about 2012, uh, end of 2012, uh, early 2013, I was tasked with this thing called the STLC. So the STLC for RME. So I figured, well, you know, I'm, I'm an engineer, I can put two and two together, and I've got a bit of experience in Agile and put in the and you know, I can put together a document, nice pictures, Put it on SharePoint, but no one can find it. And, and you know, there might be a chance that someone would actually read this thing. But actually, what was going through my head was actually not to do that. What I really wanted to do was something meaningful. I wanted to try and shift the organization in terms of how people think. I wanted to make a practical impact on the ground. And that's where the mindset shift changed for me. So for me, it was really around philosophy of thought. How you think about things? Focus on value. And what I really observed in the environment was the fact that people working day to day at the coal face and they were you know, beavering away. And they had all the tools in front of them to be able to make positive change and so solve their own problems. Yet they chose not to. And I couldn't understand it. I couldn't understand that people chose to do that. So after a lot of internal turmoil and, and uh, things going on around in my head, you know, just getting this new job, and I thought, well, take the low road and do the STLC that no one would care about, or maybe do something a bit, a bit more interesting, a bit more valuable. And that's when we started doing Agile. Now, unfortunately, Agile is not a well-liked, it's a very overloaded word. So we rebranded a few times, what we landed on was a continuous improvement initiative, CRI is what we call this thing. And that was the beginning of a great journey. Of course, mindset shift is great, but you need to follow it with action, otherwise it's really just the thought. So what I did is I, I put on my sales hat, and I went off and I went to my management team and I said, hey guys, I think there's something here, you know, I really think there's something valuable we can do. And the cell was a simple one. It said, reduce cycle time. And basically what we mean by that is the time from the moment that business say they want something to the moment that they can experience the value. That's our definition of cycle time. There were lots of other benefits that we experienced, but this is one we could sort of hang a, <coughs> hang a hat on. We could explain it to our technical people. We could explain it to our business. 
and that's how we went. So it was first my own management team, then the business CEOs, most of which who were quite skeptical at that point. I also realized quite, quite soon that because I was recruiting so much, I didn't really have dedicated time to spend on the stream of work. I thought, you know, what do I need? I need a timeless team. I need a team that can work on the ground, can coach the teams, and can shift the organization. So I came up with this idea of the Agile A team. So those of you who grew up in the 80s, like I did, I hope the music is playing in your head because it is for me. And um, so we got, we, we got the team together and we uh, composed it. So it's Kevin from Driven, Donnie from Donnie Roo, and Sandy from BSG. And so, you know, we had a team with complementary skills, different focus and different abilities. And that was awesome. So we had this team, great stuff. So we, we had the team and now what we did next was we said, okay, business and stakeholders, IT and business stakeholders, let's align our thinking. Let's go off on a, like a, a full day workshop. Let's talk about how, how we think. And we follow what's called the, the SPIRE model, and that talks about needs, values, principles, practices, and tools. And that's our philosophy of thought. So that was a great success. Everybody was happy. You know, I do think we're singing a bit of Kumbaya on the fire, but that's how it was. So we had a great team. What we really needed was an opportunity to really get, to get busy on the ground, to, to actually go into an area and, and effect a change. And so, I can't remember what day it was. I think it was probably a nondescript day. But it was one of those days where I was recruiting developers and everybody was saying, well, when am I getting my new dev? We can't find a job with developers. In fact, we can't find any developers. And who should be on the phone? But Kate is saying, I've got the system called Bob. I feel I think we're in a bit of trouble. Can I have some developers with this? And that was the start of a much bigger and more interesting conversation. turning it into usable information and distributing that downstream to all the various trading systems in the first round group for valuation and calculation of profit and loss on a daily basis. So along with them, I inherited a system they used to discharge their duties called R, the automated rates process, and 101 spreadsheets that were waiting for automation. I had absolutely no idea what I was in for. So, our pre-Agile was extremely under-maintained and underdeveloped for what it was meant to do and its criticality to the first record as a whole. Um, I had two contract developers assigned to me who worked odd hours, they were only for support, no development work. It was unstable and unable to recover in disaster situations. Its technology components were out of date and there were a host of other issues. So I engaged with Jason to get dedicated resources and start addressing the problems I could see, which at that stage I thought would take three months and uh, one dedicated developer. So we eventually embarked on the tactical project to fix this and a long list of burning issues we finally found. And this took six months from June 2013 with five dedicated developers. So on to the, the, the play. So, the tactical project team adopted Agile, and we were, we were the first to do that in the bank. Um, and these are the things we found most useful, and some of the unexpected learnings from adopting Agile. So first, the bootstrap. This was a great way to get people who haven't previously worked together organized into a team quickly. The outcome of this was a team contract, uh, defining how we interacted with each other, and what we expected of each other. This allowed us to hold each other accountable very easily. It also gave everyone an understanding of their colleagues' backgrounds and an idea of what they could expect from each other in terms of work. 
Um, this was particularly entertaining when the developers found out I had a degree in computer science. I could understand most of what they were telling me. And then the next, the board. This is my absolute favorite. It was the single most powerful tool for the project and for the team. So in practice, uh, we use the board in our daily meetings to track the state of the assigned tasks, as well as tasks not yet assigned, in other words, in the backlog. What this brings to the team and to the project is transparency, accountability, self-governance, and efficiency. It has been such a powerful tool that I now use the board to manage my rates team, which is a daily operational team. And it has allowed us to move cards between the boards as work moves between the two teams for testing. But this is the learning. This board is not for everyone. The unexpected learning here is around the psychology of how exposed and inadequate this can make someone feel. This wasn't considered at the start of the project, and it wasn't something we addressed in the bootstrap of the team. It's very easy to see who isn't coping or up to standard, and that can be very embarrassing for the impact of the person. <coughs> My experience with it was that this had a very negative impact on the team and on the project as the impact of members started to disengage and became obstructive. They did eventually dis uh, uh, self-eject from the project and that has happened in my race team as well. But it is something that we caution them to be very aware of. Then on to iteration planning. We settled on a two-week iteration cycle after a few weeks together. And the iteration planning helped us to prepare for the workload coming down the line. And it meant that the team agreed on the work to be done in the next iteration, which meant better productivity. <coughs> we also found iteration planning to be a great way of protecting the team from the arsonists. In other words, the ill-considered business requests. <laughs> and this stops the team from being distracted and also provides structure. This process also gave the team a sense of immediate achievement and tasks as tasks are actually completed in the cycle, the value is added. This feeds the team's energy, and so my favorite analogy here was when I compared them to Audrey, the plant in the little shop forest. The more I gave them, the more they wanted. Originally, each iteration ended with a demo and a retrospective. The retrospectives were very busy at the beginning, while people were getting used to each other, and they were fun. I mean, our coaches brought us Lego and brought us bouncy balls and all sorts of things. However, we eventually combined the demo and then did away with them completely as the daily meetings and the iteration planning was sufficient for us. An additional learning here was that this forced downstream systems to start to follow suit or at least plan around us as only requests prioritized the iteration planning and were considered for the next iteration and there were absolutely no exceptions. So in January last year, Johnny asked me to write a letter to myself from June 2013, which he helped me with. Um, and what I'm going to read to you now is the letter I wrote to myself 36 months before. So, dear planners from June, getting off stable and under control will be possible and quicker than you anticipated. The way that you'll be working with the team now forces discussions to happen daily, and good decisions are made often as swiftly. The bi weekly retrospective and planning serves as a good time to evaluate whether we are on the right track or not, as well as building a team rapport. I remember how much you were struggling to get feedback from the developers. I know that the developers will disappear for long periods, so I need to come back with half baked solutions. This has all changed now. I get feedback far more often than I redirect them as needed. The team is now five developers. You know those concerns about onboarding new people. And all the people came on board much quicker than expected. The way in which the team and work is structured allows for more collaboration, and the new people can get into our work much quicker. The dev team, including me, had a bootstrap session. In the bootstrap, every person had a chance to tell their story of why they were there. That allowed us as a team to start telling the story of us. It led to a team contract that was drawn up to satisfy everyone's values. This contract is being used to call out behavior that damages the team. So I have taken some ideas from the dev team to my ops team. The ops team now have their own board, fashioned around the board that the developers use. Made benefit to my team and I get from this visibility. 
the OS team has taken to calling the daily meeting a board meeting. If I look back at it now, I have learned a few things in the past few months. If you hire the right people and get them working together well, great things happen. Don't believe everything you hear. A Kanban board is useful for everyone, including your family, and forces accountability without people feeling micromanaged. Assign work to the team, not to the person. It has been an awesome experience, and the project is the poster project for Agile in the Bank. The project will over-deliver, and you will also be able to present this good news to senior management. The project will give you a set of management techniques that will stand you in good stead for the rest of your career. Thank you. Thanks, Dennis, for letting your story and your experience. So it really was a great thing, the, the op story. And for us, I, mean, I felt like a scene from the Lion King because we, we went to a, a board meeting and we had one of these amazing meetings where you told the story and you, know, you, you said what would happen and it did. And you know, so it was just, you know, here's the all, there's the, you know, there's the baby, Simba is born. And um, so, so Candice and I were very much in this sort of high-fiving thing, um, thinking, wow, okay, we wax this thing. You know, it's, it's amazing what's, what's been achieved. But I think that was short-lived. What we realized is to, to shift one team is actually a lot easier than shifting an organization. So we definitely, uh, we definitely realized we needed to do some different things. What we did achieve with Valve, which is useful as well, is that it was far more auditable. Now, auditors that's a discussion in itself. But there were a lot of things that we achieved other than just getting the team to operate better. So these were the learnings we had. The reality was we had two coaches on the ground. We were still burning with our resources. You know, due to the restructure, I was still recruiting a lot. And at the time, we didn't, didn't know that you know, trying to get in and, and shift people and teams that are running at 150% uh, capacity working on production fires, you probably need to prioritize where you spend your time and, and probably elsewhere because actually to be able to shift them would be lucky. We also had you know, some people who were the naysayers, they were like, oh, okay, you know, it's isolated, you can't do it in an organization. Actually, you know, let's wait and see. You know, so a couple of stones were thrown. And then, of course, when you look inside and you say, well, sure, okay, so with a bit of success comes the expectation of a whole lot more of success. And you know, could we do this in the, the broader context? So what we realized is we needed a framework, a few, a few frameworks to actually guide our thinking. How are we going to deal with this? So we put some frameworks together. So the frameworks that we put together really talked around how we engage, how we engage with individuals, how we engage with the teams, and how we move from the initial conversations to deep coaching and back again, depending on how the teams mature. We also needed to think quite carefully around prioritization. So where we, where we put our time and energy, you know, we've got, uh, we've got limited capacity, in, in, in both in terms of our teams and our coaches, and what we said is, Go to the areas that are strategically most important and uh, areas that have the lowest barrier of entry. And, and that's what we did. The other thing we said is, well, what are we targeting? Where do we want to go? What is the enterprise fluency that we want to get to? Uh, and, and ultimately what we decided is, we don't want to just shift the teams, we want to shift the organization. And that was a conscious decision. So we went through the prioritization process and, and we decided that Post of the next two teams that we should focus on are our biggest trading system, that shall not be named, and, and our infrastructure team. So, the trading system, so that's Jason and David sitting in the audience. Hi, David. This is about you and your team. So, when we started in the team, there were, there were silos everywhere. Um, work was allocated to individuals, not the team. There was key person dependency. There really wasn't any transparency on who was doing what at a 
point in time. And due to those multiple inflows, there's lots of impact work as well. And the team weren't necessarily as happy as they could be. Stress levels were pretty high, you know, it, it wasn't great for them. Um, the other thing that we didn't have is, we didn't have a product owner. We didn't have that person from business who could help us to prioritize what's most important from the business perspective. The other thing that you need to understand about the system is that it serves multiple lines of business. So there's a lot of businesses that use one platform, and we have a team around the platform. So we started the process, and the coaching very much was like a long distance relationship. I mean, coaches went into the team, uh, worked with the team, the team said, okay guys, we can do some stuff, and they did. And this went on and, on, on and off for a bit, but I think the team made some major changes and shifted things in, in a big way. So what we have now is we have one pipeline of work, and, and that really changes the game. Team members pull the work from the park. The work's categorized. There's a project, enhancement, run the bank, technical debt. The team has conversations. That's probably the biggest thing. And that helps them to become self-organized. Unplanned work is, is a dirty word, or a dirty set of words. And I think the team's working very hard to get rid of that. And we also have someone who plays a product owner uh, role and, and takes all of the requirements from the digital different business lines and puts it into a piece of priority that the team can work with. And I think that's helped um, a huge amount in terms of how the team operates. So that was that was the trading team. Then we moved into the infrastructure <coughs> team. Um, so this team you know has got an interesting story. I see some of the team here, Rakash, Tony, Ward, Tim, put your hands up, say hi. <laughs> okay, two of you in the room. So the, the infrastructure team um, was actually a little, a little restructure in a bigger restructure because what we had is we had an RMB team merging with a first track corporate center team, two, two teams, two silos, you know, each with different ways of work, not necessarily right or wrong, but different. And I don't think there was a lot of communication in the team, back to business, um, and I don't think there also wasn't clear understanding around what business wanted. So the guys were doing work, but they didn't know to what end. So if I if I do this or not that, what, what does that mean? The context of the work wasn't clear. And there were lots of pipelines of work. You know, work coming into individuals. You do see some patterns here, you know, of the previous team. And that was interesting. There was also a lot of a lot of screaming on the ground. So Whoever screened loudest typically got everybody to drop what they were doing and, and pick up the project. And I think one of the biggest things that the teams were doing, both both the FRCC and RMB guys, so the silos within the greater, the greater team, is they were constantly fighting production fires. So there wasn't really time for anything other than production. It was really just, you know, fix the issue and we'll get to the projects when we get to them. So initially, getting into the infrastructure team was, was interesting because our head of infrastructure at the time was not so excited about the idea. And so with a bit of uh, sweet talking and then a quite a heavy push, we, we started working and coaching and, uh, with the team who, who became incredibly receptive and they became the greatest change agents. You know, the people sitting in the room have done some amazing work. So what we did is we, we created this thing called the business goal. So what does business want? What's, what, is the, what is the end? What's the thing that success looks like? And that flowed all the way through the value chain, all the way through to infrastructure. We also created teams within the teams called crews to focus on different domains like Windows and Linux. Teams started having constructive discussions. And I think one of the biggest things we achieved in the infrastructure team is velocity. Our velocity doubled in the first six months, and it's been going on an upward trajectory for the last uh, at least 12 months that we've been working. Um, and I think a lot of this can be attributed by the fact that we're limiting work in progress. You know, all of the theory and the stuff you read about people's law, it works. It really does. And our stakeholders, so much happier. The fact that they're engaged in the process, they can see our Kanban board, it's like five meters wide, it's a massive thing. 
Um, and they can engage and they get information around where things are, what the challenges are. So our stakeholders are very happy. I also would love to know if anybody else is an uh, agile infrastructure team. I think uh, that's got to be a first somewhere. So these two examples are great, but I guess what I wanted to highlight is even though there seem to be similarities, there's no recipe. You don't, you don't put your ingredients in a bowl, mix it all up, put it in your cake tray and bake it in. It doesn't work like that. Every team's different. Um, and the other thing we did is these are just two examples. What we've done is we've actually gone through every team in the organization and we've taken them on a journey to transform them. And what, how do we do that? Well, some teams pulled on us. And what I mean by that is they said, hey guys, we're ready to be coached. We want to adopt this thing. And some teams we had to push, and that's okay. So pushing did lead to a bit of cargo culting. What I mean by that is people running around doing all of these things, but not really understanding what the context was. So they do all these practices, but they wouldn't understand why. So we've, we've engaged and we're coaching those teams through that, and we're at a good point. So earlier in the year, we got to a point where we said, well, what's next, guys? We started this two years ago, roughly. What do we do? And we said, well, it's time for the enterprise shift. It's time to make the next step. It's time to do the big stuff. So we got our senior execs, you know, guys on the board, got them into a, a room and said, hey guys, we really want to not just shift the teams, but shift the enterprise through the whole value chain. Because the ultimate value is being able to deliver work through all of the teams, end to end, in an organization which is highly solid, like RMB. So we started our first iteration of looking at our enterprise book of work. We've aligned the work that needs to be done across the teams, and we're experimenting on how to actually optimize our cycle time. We're not there, but we certainly are on a path where we have people that are engaged from technology and business who are willing to experiment to take us to the point. So at this point, what I'd like to do is just say thank you. Thanks, Candice. It's been fun. It's been painful. Uh, but it's been cool, too. Thanks to the management team. So to my many bosses, Shabir, Alan, Duran. So Duran helped in the pushing, uh, with the pushing because at some point there was no pull. So he pushed, and that was awesome. To the Agile team, I mean, two years is like a big chunk of your lives. Really appreciate the time and energy you've put in. Kevin, Donnie, and, and others. And then, of course, the Agile advocates in r and You know, we came on mass here today, for 30 people. We take this seriously. We want to do this. So, to you guys, your energy, enthusiasm, the time you've put in, resilience, thank you so much. I'm very proud of your r and Um, are there any questions? We've got a couple of minutes to play with. Go ahead. Um, the confusion of our team members who weren't quite uh, performers. Were there anybody who was actually salvageable during that process? disengaged, there was no risk of getting them back. It's also, you know, if, if you're a developer who hasn't worked in the Agile framework before, there's a very little resistance to that. So, we actually, none of them were salvageable. Everybody who ended up being part of the sort of M team of five developers, you know, sort of five on a potential basis as they came and left, but we were new to it. And certainly also on my operational team, it's not self-critical. The thing is that it's that, it's that, that speed as well. Um, it's very frightening for some people, they just can't, can't get into that. So guys who, like, as I mentioned at the beginning, one or two to be left in the back to do their own thing and come back sort of every second day, just don't buy into it. Uh, right in the beginning, or maybe 
sent through you. Someone mentioned uh, it was in my notes. I'm putting together a contract, uh, making sure each person knows what's expected from each other. Do you like extrapolate that? Like, what was that like? Yeah. So it got it was well to do it was quite a lot of fun. Um, so of course, you know, taking away off of sites and, and talking about it, but what it, it came down to were things like um, you know we're not. We're not late for meetings, so the daily stand-up starts at 10 o'clock, you're there at 10 o'clock. And you know, the respect that you show each other is that you're there at 10 o'clock. Then things like making sure that you kept it simple, that you, if you were stuck, that you, that you asked. And there was just a whole lot of things that came from the team to say, these are, I suppose in a way, these are the things that are, are my core values, or these are the things that I find very frustrating. So some people find it very frustrating, and somebody's always Five minutes late to the meeting, you know, and that can be bold and become you know, busy. And so it was that. So it was down to some really, really basic things, huh? and it sort of built as we went. And I think by the end of the, end of the session, we had about twenty you know, values that people had brought into. Yeah. 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 Okay, we've got one more question, and then we'll have to wrap it up. And of course, that's why the Indaba room is there, okay. so that we can continue the conversation. So when you were looking at contracting a new way of work as a team, did you find that there were any conflicts with how you know, people were traditionally performance managed in the organization? So there's an HR contract behind it, and then you've just recontracted some sort of new ways of measuring each other's performance. Yeah, they actually didn't talk to each other at all. So the HR contract being kind of very basic and you know, don't fall asleep at your desk kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Not come into that team contracting. That team contracting is about uh, how, you know, what are basically what are like our hygiene rules. You, know, you don't come late. I use this one about coming late to meetings. You, you know, you don't come late to a meeting. That's it. You know, if you're late, you let somebody know. You, know, you, you respect each other in the team. So it's very professional. Like so it's very different to you know, your HR contract, which is basically the following instruction. Um, Jason, Candice, thank you so much for presenting your experience and sharing that with us. I think uh, many of 